أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد وعلى إطرد التيبين الطاهرين المعصمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وبعد السلام عليكم everyone welcome to another uh, episode of Real Talk before I introduce our guest for this week I would just like to um, give tribute to Maruma Nishad Bai Dosa, who was uh, a guest, uh, a former guest on Real Talk, who um, went back to the mercy of our creator um, a little while ago. And um, we've been having a lot of people listening, re listening to her, her interview. And um, the words of wisdom that came from um, Nishad Bai are amazing. And I think one of the things that I have been told over and over again is. Um, how much people are learning from her. And, I, and and it's beautiful because the whole idea behind this real talk was for us just to learn from each other and, and you know, from learn from amazing women within our community who have amazing life uh, experiences and they're sharing, willing to share their life experience so that we can actually all learn from them and hopefully make our life experience a little bit easier through, what, through learning from what they've been through. And um, I know we've, I know I personally picked up a lot when I spoke to Nishit Bay, um, Maruma Nishit Bay. And um, I'm sure you all will as well if you'd like to re listen to that or any of the previous ones. They're all on Hood's YouTube channel. So please feel free to listen to them when you have a chance. So today um, we have Nasim Bay Banjwani with us. Um, Salam alaikum, Nasim Bay. Alaikum salam. How are you, Masma? Alhamdulillah. How about yourself? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on Real Talk. Um, thank if you I for inviting me. If I can just ask you to just introduce yourself and then we'll continue from that. Sure. Uh, I'm Nassim. Um, I came to UK as a refugee in 1972. We were one of the Idi Amin lot. Uh, we were separated uh, by you know, our siblings, half of them were here, half couldn't come, my parents couldn't come. And we came in UK and then we were in camps. I got part schooling, I studied here, part was back home and I finished my degree in psychology here. Uh, I lived most of my life in Chelmsford. I have, I'm married, I've got three children, two grandchildren. And at the moment, I have moved to Harrow last year, literally. And uh, I think uh, I have, well, let me see now. I have done quite a bit of work since then. I am a cookery tutor for the Adult Community College. I am an assessor, a trainer, a facilitator for Macmillan. And my passion really is to raise awareness uh, in cancer services for cancer patients especially in the ethnic minority diverse cultures. So I'm really, really keen to help can, them. Can I ask what got you into this? Um, where did this passion come from? I think it all stemmed from my mom. Uh, I lost my mom when she, uh, she was about 56 and I was in my early 30s. And I think what I saw, what she went through, especially when she couldn't speak the language, um, she couldn't communicate uh, as to what was happening, her feelings, her emotions, her fear, her loneliness. She didn't even know what cancer was. And I think when I saw her, I felt that I wish I could have helped her more because that the same thing happened to me. I was then diagnosed with breast cancer. So I think wow. I felt a sense of guilt and I felt that I wish I could have done more. I wish I could have known more about the illness. I wish I could have educated her, but I think did you feel I, that. Sorry to interrupt. So, did you feel yeah. that when you went through a similar um, experience as your mother, that now you understood what she must have been going through, which you previously yes. hadn't understood? Absolutely, and I think I felt the fear, the loneliness, the fear of the uncertainty, the fear of the unknown, and I think the word cancer, the first thing that comes into mind is a death sentence. You know, and, and you're scared not for yourself, but for others, for your children, for your husband, as to how they're going to survive. And I think in her case, she was gone so quickly. Within three months, she was gone. So we didn't even get a chance to talk about it or share what she was going through, share as a family. 
as to what should we do? How, how do we manage this? How do we cope with the illness? How do we comfort her? I think, I, I don't know why, but we, we as a culture, I think in our community, there's very lack of, lack of uh, communication because we feel that, oh, how can we say things like that? How can we share emotions or show emotions openly? And I think it's important to share that. I think what I'm getting from you, um, which is quite an eye opener, is that um, when something like cancer happens within a family, um, mm. the, the family are there to support each other. But yes. um, sometimes because you haven't been through it, you can't really empathize with the person. And so Absolutely. I think what I was getting from you is it, it's worth going outside of the family and talking to someone who's actually been through it so that yes. they can actually then have that communication, uh, have that conversation, which will um because they can actually understand what you're going through yes absolutely and i think if you are aware of the services around you that really helps and i think hard time there were very few services so we really didn't know where to go for help either and in my time i still very few services this is about 30 years ago and if you compare then and now there's a lot more available it's just how to ask for it where to look for it if you're local, look around Google, there's so many support groups and that, but it's also being empowering yourself, trying to find out what you need and asking for it. And I think when we don't ask for it, we're not gonna get the services. And even this, now- this is, Sorry, this is um, in every aspect of our lives, right? I think a lot yeah. of the times um, we feel like we need to do it on our own. And, yes. and you know we, yes. we don't like to ask for help even if it's from family members even those close to us yes. we don't like to ask for help and i yes. i feel that more with um the older generation than than the youngsters um yes. and it, there's that concept of now nah, you know god is there for me i don't need anyone else yes but i think if you look at that god is there yes but then god is also telling you help yourself he's telling you to find out what is around you what help is there and he, he's he's there to guide you, but at the same time you have to help you your house, right? And and yeah. send people and and help to you. And if you yeah. don't access yeah. that help, then that's on you. Yes, absolutely. And it, things like, for example, counselling, it's there, and this a lot of services are free. And also, I think it's important to to take into consideration your family, like your children, the carers, the family around you, the extended family. They're all suffering. They're all going through emotions. So there, there are things that are out there. There are support groups as well. There, there's counseling for them available as well. And sometimes we don't know that it's free. You don't have to pay anything. But it's, it's, I think the embarrassment as to, oh, how do I go about it? Where will I go? And people find out and they'll say, oh my God, she's asking for this, she's going for this. So I think that taboo, the stigma is still attached to it and we need to break that. Is the taboo attached to asking for help in general, or is the taboo ask, uh, attached to asking for um, counselling and then things like that? Definitely counselling. I feel that I, I do remember saying to sometimes some people say that, but counselling is for people if you're mad. And I said, no, it isn't like that. So people st still think like that, that you're weak if you have counselling sessions or if you go to a counsellor, that you're a weak person, you're not strong, you are vulnerable. and but. If you, if you go there, you're going there for a reason, you want to get better. And somebody is there to listen to you, somebody neutral. And they are going to do all that in confidence. It's important to mention that it's nothing is going to get repeated outside. They're not allowed to do that. So, so if you do need that, that space to go and speak to somebody, yes, you should really take that on board. Brilliant. And, and the other thing that we were saying about how, you know, people tend to think that um, they're very much that God is there for them and, and they don't need anyone else. Um, do you think that is more arrogance and pride rather than um, faith? Because like you said, um, yes, God is there, but God sends people in our lives. God sends um, help in our lives. And for us not to use that um, because we feel like, you know, um, I can manage with God on my but that's not how God wants us to be. He's made us social creatures, right? So it, it yes, seems yes. like it's more arrogant and pride not allowing us to ask for help rather than faith. I think it's also cultural. I feel that we want to do things ourselves and the stigma attached to it is that I can do it on my own, I'm strong. And you don't want to, again, sound weak in front of your family or fall weak and say, no, you know, we are super moms. 
We're supposed to do everything, we manage everything. And when we fall ill, we think, no, but how can I ask for somebody to do this for me? But I'm, that they'll think that I'm very weak and that I can't do it, I can't look after my family. But it isn't that, and I think it is important to talk, it is important to ask the, the help because they don't know what you need. You have to tell them. And sometimes um, we feel that, oh, they, they don't understand what you're going through. It is true, they don't. Unless you've been through it yourself, they don't know what you're going through. They're not in your shoes. So you have to guide them and tell them, look, yes, I need kids picked up or I need some food. I don't feel like eating or I'm tired today or, or just come and sit with me. You know, that's so important because that's what I needed. I needed somebody just to listen, nothing else. Or tell me, uh, what, how was your treatment? How do you feel now? Um, how, what, what really are the side effects? Is there something I can do for you? I felt that people were trying to, to keep a distance in the sense that they didn't know what to say or what to ask me. They were afraid maybe of hurting my feelings. I think people are very sensitive. So they want to, they want to skirt around the issue rather than try and find out the right way to talk and communicate to cancer patients or anybody with them. So I, I suppose it's it's that concept of um, you sort of um, actually asking for help um, and realizing that um, in a way you're giving opportunity for other people to serve the creator through serving his creation. Absolutely. Um, so rather than thinking that you're doing, you know, um, you're you're making it difficult for people, actually thinking, you know what, I'm giving them an opportunity. Yes. Um, because I yes. need their help, and unless given, you know, yes. through me, inshallah, they'll get closer to the creator, inshallah. Yes, and I also think so that they're flipping it. Yes, they they will feel useful that they're doing something as well. Mm. They feel yeah. good that look, I'm I'm trying to help, and that's the help he or she needs. And I think they will feel better themselves that that is the right help they're giving as well. Yeah, and I think a lot of the times it's it's funny because I know um, a lot of people say you know if you need any help call me if you need anything let me know, and we yeah. we think no they're just saying it. But yes. um, why yeah. not do husn zan and think, no, they actually mean it. And if they don't, then that's their problem. They shouldn't have said it. And I yes. just take them up on it. And, and I think keeping keeping up to that promise, they might just say it, but you have to test them. Are they actually going to do it, follow it through? So, yeah. yes, that's a really good way of going about it. And if, sometimes people just say thinking, oh, she's not going to ask me anyway. <laughs> But I think the, 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 the situation here is, yes, test them and say, well, okay, I need you to make me soup or whatever. And and are they going to deliver it? Because then you know that they were genuine or not. Yeah, no, that, that's beautiful. Um, you, you mentioned that you'd gone through a similar experience. Um, do you want to expand on that a little bit? And then... Yeah, sure. Um, I think in my case, um, it was, 90, oh, I'm trying to think now, it's over 30 years ago, 2001. Uh, everything was fine and I, I just, I think what in my case was I had instinct that I had a lump in my breast, my left breast. And I, I felt it, it was very, very small, very minute, like a little pebble. And my finger kept going there, uh, touching it. And I thought, oh, maybe it's nothing. But a little inner voice kept telling me, have yourself checked, have yourself checked. So I, I thought for a while, something is niggling me, there's something not right. So I went to my GP and I told him, he's a male, he was a male GP, by the way, in Chelmsford, and uh, I didn't want him to examine me, uh, just sheer because I thought he's a male. And I said, look, I think I've got a lung, and can you please send me for a mammogram? A mammogram is a screen, a screening, uh, uh, radiation, uh, not sorry, it's screening. And uh, he said, okay, I'll write the, a letter to the breast clinic. And he wrote to them, but they came back saying that, you know, she's too young. We don't want to see her. Even and though he mentioned that there was a lump that you yes, felt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He said that, wow. that she got a lump. And then the second time around, I went again and I said something still not right. And by then I'd lost my mother. So I told him, look, you have to mention the importance here. It's in the family history that I've lost my mom. And then third time I went again, he wrote again to them, again, they denied. Third time again, my aunt, which is my mom's sister, she also had breast cancer and she even died. And I went again, and I said, look, you need to tell them it's urgent. And he wrote again. And this time, this was a space, within a space of five years, going to and from wow. to the 
five years. So from the first so, time you went till you actually got seen uh, for a mammogram was five after years. After five years. After five wow. years. Okay. And then I thought, this is ridiculous. They don't even want to see me. And I, I really think that they ignored me totally, totally ignored me because they thought I'm young, I won't get it. And when I did go, eventually, they made me fill a really long form. It was horrible. I couldn't remember half the things in there, the dates of my mom, my aunt, when they got diagnosed, things like that. And then eventually they said, okay, you qualify for a mammogram. And they, they, they screened me. Then I went home. I didn't hear anything. They said, we'll send you results in two weeks' time. Two, three, four, five, six weeks. I didn't hear anything. And then I thought, maybe it's nothing. Uh, sixth week, just seventh week, I got a letter in the post saying, come to the breast cleaning, uh, breast cleaning, a so-and-so time, and bring somebody with you. Very formal letter. That was it. Oh yeah. And literally, I, I went on that day. In, no, before that, I do before week, and I said, look, I got this letter, and I'm worried. What, what is it? Why do you want to see me? And they said, she said, um, oh. You have to see the doctor. She didn't tell me anything, but I knew then there's something not right. And the day of the appointment, um, I told my husband, can you please drop the kids to school? And I just waved him by and that was it. And I went to the clinic. I had a really horrible feeling, a really sinking feeling that something's not right. I went in the room and I saw three, two consultants and a nurse in the room. I saw an X-ray of my breast and I knew what it was, I knew it was my left breast. I knew where the lump was, so I didn't even see it. I told them, this is my breast, isn't it? And they said, yes. And I said, I know where my lump is. And they said, show me. And I showed them in my own body. And they said, how did you know? And I said, because I kept telling you this. So they said, yes, you're right. The lump is there. So I said, now what? So they said, we need to find out if it's malignant or not. So they said, we need to do a needle biopsy. A needle biopsy is when they insert it in your breast tissue to get a tissue sample out to mm. check if there are any cancerous cells or not. A very big needle. So I said, okay, and when will I know? And they said, in, within one hour, you will get the results. Wow. So they did the test. Um, I came out of the room and again, I knew what they're going to tell me. I rang my husband and I said, look, you better get here. He had just got to the surgery and he canceled his patients. He came back. After an hour, we both went back to the room. And when we went in, three of them were sitting there. And flippantly, the consultant said, it's as we thought, Mrs. Panjwani, you have breast cancer. It's malignant. What was the first thing that went through your mind? The first thing that went through my mind Masuma, was anger. I was so angry at them. I said, the first thing I said to them was, you didn't listen. You did not listen to me. I will tell you this for the past five years. And then I had one question in mind, which is, how long has my lump been sitting there? And you know what she said? She said, five years. Oh, my gosh. She actually said five years and I just looked at her. I, I didn't know what else to do or say. I was numb, I shock, disbelief. It must have been so difficult because you have so many emotions, but then this anger that you must have felt would you know, yes. overcome all the other emotions and to actually deal with the fact that you have cancer, um, but at the same time trying to deal with the anger of not being heard all these years. Exactly, exactly. And I think so difficult. especially when you can speak English and they didn't, it's not as if I didn't know the language or they didn't understand me. That made me even more angry. And, and then I thought maybe it's, it's who we are, what we are, and they're denying the services to us. What is it? And just because you're young, that doesn't mean you're not going to get the cancer. You can get it at a younger age as well. And it was family history, but they totally, totally ignored that, totally ignored that. The whole situation could have been averted, the treatment, everything, but this is how, what it came to. And then all she said was that now you'll, you'll see your oncologist, you will go and see them, and then you'll make an appointment and we'll call you. And that was it. She gave me a booklet and she said, you go home now. That was it. Wow. 
So no other support, nothing, nothing there at all. It, Until you just, went to see the oncologist? Not at the same, not the same thing. Another time, they, I had to make an appointment the following week. And I just went home. Uh, we had come in two different cars, and I told my husband, you go, and I'll follow you. But I didn't want to go home. Uh, I had so many emotions running through my mind. Uh, the first thing I thought was, I'm going to die. Um, but I wasn't worried about myself because I had lost my mom to breast cancer, my aunt. That's, that's why I thought that, that I'm not going to live long. But I wasn't worried about myself. I think I was more worried about my children. How are they going to survive? And then I just, you know, I just went to the local supermarket. It's so strange, silly things you do. I went there, I went around, I did literally buy anything. I looked at the people and I said, you guys are so lucky. Because all I could see was normal life, a normality going around me. And I wanted to scream, scream so loud. But I thought, no, how can I scream in a supermarket? If there was a hill, I would have done that. So I think I had pent up emotions inside me. Which I wanted to let out, but I was just holding myself back. And then I just went home and that was it. And we got about the same you know, thing that we do. And by dinner time, uh, the kids came home from school. Uh, my husband picked them up. And we all had dinner together, at least one meal. So we sat down. And I don't know, I, I think the kids could feel there was some tension. We were very quiet. And then they remembered that uh, I had an appointment that day. And they said, oh, mom, you had an appointment. How did it go? And I said, um, okay. And again, they said, they looked at me and they said, something's not right. So I looked at my husband and I said, trying to, uh, what can I say? And uh, I didn't want to use the word cancer. I didn't want to frighten them. I think at that time also my son was in his final year of A-levels and I thought, oh, how can I tell him things? He's going to affect his studies. My daughter, my other son, and I just said, um, yeah, I did go and the doctor has found something. It's, it's not very nice, but they're going to remove it. And they didn't understand what I meant. And um, mm -hmm. so they said, what do you mean, mom? And I said, well, Something's there, it's not very nice, but they want to clean that, they want to clear that, so I get better. And then my youngest son just looked at me and said, Mom, are you going to die? Oh my gosh. And I looked at him and I'm thinking, what can I say? What, what do I tell him? Because I didn't know myself what's mm. going to happen to me. So, the simplest thing I think I came up with at that time was, I don't know. I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to lie. And I didn't know what the future was for me. So I just said, Alirazza, I really don't know. And can I, can I ask, what was your, how, how was God in um, your relationship with God and, and what you were thinking and, and were you talking to God or what, were you asking him? Were you blaming him? What, what was going on with you and God yes. at that moment? Yes, you know, Master, I felt a lot of guilt. I felt he's given me this illness for a reason. Um, maybe I've done something in the past. Uh, maybe there were some actions I did or I might, I don't know. I, I You know, you, you have all these things going in your head. What did I do? Why did I get it? Why me? First question when they told me was, why me? Why did they choose me amongst all my siblings? Why me, you know? And I, I, I think I questioned him. I talked to him. I was angry at first with him thinking, well, he's given it to me. Then I thought, well, how do I connect myself again? In the sense, you know, along the way, you, you do all your wajibas, you do everything. You, you're so busy in your life, but you never stop and you don't reflect. You don't thank God sometimes. You don't pause and you don't thank him for what you have around you. And I'm thinking maybe he's, he's testing me now. He's trying to tell me, well, hold, hold on now. Hold your horses. You're going too fast in your life. You need to stop and think now. Remember me now. Remember what you have. You've forgotten me. So I think in time I saw that. Initially I didn't. In time I thought, you know what? Something is there. Something is telling me something. There's a voice telling me, 
you know, rethink, prioritize your life. There's something there. There's something that's missing in your life. So that's exactly what I did. And I think when people give you prayers and they say, read this, read that, there is definitely power in that. There's truth in that. I didn't find contentment. I was such a, I'm still a restless person. And I was all, all the time on edge. And then people said, Re recite Ziyarat Ashura, recite this. And I found peace in that. That really helped me. And then I talked to God and I said, okay, God, you've given this to me now. So you're going to look after me. And I think that helped me. But the other thing that helped me also was I was in denial because of the anger that I felt. I didn't want to accept that I had cancer. I just didn't want to accept that I had it. Because of the, 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 the shock, it, I put it behind me. And that helped me cope in that year getting through all the treatments that I had. So I think the connection with God helped me in the end to find peace. But at the same time, my emotions, the anger and the denial helped me being strong that no, I'm not going to accept it. I'm just going to get through this. And that's really what helped me through. So you're not, you weren't actually processing your emotions. You were just robotically going through Absolutely. all the treatment that needed to be gone through. Exactly. I was just, it's like a, automatic motion you know like an automatic car you just put the gear it just goes so i just followed whatever they were telling me i did whatever they were saying and i think there were times when i lost my life during my third chemo and actually because they tried a new drug on me and i thought that's it i'm going to die now it's just ridiculous i could see myself up on the ceiling blown up in pieces and looking down at my husband and it was so strange that feeling I had of that's it, I'm going, I'm going. And I, I'm trying to call my husband and I'm telling him, you know, look at me, something's not right. The drug's affecting me really badly. Tell the nurse, call the nurse. And it is so strange. He's reading a paper. He loves his newspapers. And I kept telling him, you know, I, I was tied up. Um, you know, during my third chemo, it was, you know, you're attached. You've got so many drugs in your body and mm. so many things going on. And, all I could see was I was blowing, you know, like a balloon. And then at the end, what happens to a balloon? It bursts. Yeah. So I, I, I thought to God that, God, now I'm going and I, you're going to see parts of my body all over. And I could actually see that. It was so frightening. And I said, wow. my husband's going to see me in pieces now, very soon. And suddenly, I don't know what happened. He just sort of looked up and I was having all this... Um, eye movements, eye contact, there's something wrong, call the nurse. He came and stopped the, the, the drug going through my bodies and then called the nurse. So I think that was a really near-death experience I had as well. So sometimes you, know, you just don't know, you, you're, doing, you're going by the motion, but you accept what they're giving you, you don't question, but it's very important to question what the drugs are going to do to you as well and the side effects as well. Yeah. All of everything that you went through, um, do you feel it could have been avoided if they had listened to you at the beginning? Absolutely, absolutely. I wouldn't have needed the chemotherapy. I probably would have just needed radiotherapy because I was I had six lots of chemotherapy. I had radiotherapy for a whole two three months again. Then I had um, injections in my legs to boost my immune system. Then I had Zolodex injections. I had tamoxifen for five years. It's so many things I went through could have been avoided if they'd heard me in time, if they'd listened. They would have also saved so much money with all the treatments they gave me, basically. And I, I think it's so important that you are heard, that you're aware of your own body. Make a fuss, make a noise. Don't keep quiet. You know, the services are out there for you. But I think so many yeah, I think Sorry. a lot of the times, I think a lot of the times we feel like one either, um, you know, what do we know? They're the doctors; they sh they know better, and yet yes. we we know our, you know, every one of us knows our body better than anyone else. Um, secondly, I think yeah. we also, like you said, think happen, you know, it's, it's a waste of money if I go there and I'm wasting their time, yeah. I'm wasting their money. But like you said, yeah. the, the the time and the money and the energy that was required in the treatment was much much more than if you've Absolutely. been had. And, and I think the third thing is as well, you know, even if it 
ends up to be nothing. Isn't yes. it better that you find out that it's nothing than have that mental anxiety of could it be, could it be, could it be sort of thing? Absolutely. And I think it's peace of mind. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's finding out if there's something unusual will tell is nothing but really you know your body because you know how you have you are how healthy you are something was not right you will feel a lump you'll feel some irregularities in your bowel you might see blood in your urine you might see blood in your poo anything that you see unusual a nipple you see that there's a crack or dry soreness bleeding discharge you know it's not normal and they might say okay try something come back in a week and you know in a week again you go back and it's still not right you have to insist for a second referral and say, look, no, I'm still not happy. I want to be seen. I want to be screened because I still think there's something else wrong because they can't see inside you. They can only see the surface. You know your body inside out. They don't. So it's, I think the lesson is kick up a yes. fuss. Speak up, definitely kick up a fuss. And, okay, so, um, so you went through all of this. Um, and then what what happened afterwards? I mean, like th there's a lot of learning that obviously came out from you going through all your treatment and everything, and um, therefore your passion that you said in sort of helping others. How did that come about? I think it came about because what I went through, what I saw my mom go through, uh, I, I just felt that to raise awareness was so important, to, especially in the ethnic diverse communities. They don't know the language. They cannot access the services because there's still inequalities in the services uh, and they cannot speak the language. Sometimes they're alone, they're isolated, they don't have anybody to take them to and fro to, to the services, to support groups. And they don't really ask for help because they think it's something embarrassing. Again, like we've discussed before, that they think that they're weak or the community will see them as vulnerable and that they're weak, they're asking for help. It isn't that. It is, or that it they is, don't have faith, right? Is that concept exactly, of if you, if you believe in yes. God, if you have faith in God, then you don't need to ask. Exactly. I think crazy. it works yeah, two way because you have there is faith, but at the same time, faith is telling it to be sensible. Yeah. It's telling you there is there are people out there to help you. There are services out there. Yes, there is medical help as well. There's complementary therapy. There's so much out there these days, but you don't know if you don't ask. And sometimes, the, the, if you go to the GPs, they'll tell you, yes, go on the internet. Sometimes you, are not, you don't have access to computers. So you might be illiterate, you can't speak English, so you don't know, well, how do I find out all this? So it is important to get somebody to, to, to at least get some help from somebody who can speak the language, who can be an advocate as well. And if you need to go with somebody, you know, find a friend or uh, anybody who, who might be, you know, there, there are people out there, there are helplines, there are people who can help you say, okay, I'll come with you. And we'll ask the right questions, write things down. And it's important, you, you think you're wasting the doctor's time and the oncologist's time, but you're not. It is your time. Why, why don't you make yourself important? It is your life. It's not their life. They're just going to say, oh, I've got five minutes. There's a patient, there's so many, about 10, 20 patients waiting for you. But no, we always think that, oh, there are 20 patients waiting. I'm only going to take two minutes. But I learned that the hard way. I used to go just quickly in and out. Then I used to go home and think, oh, I wish I'd asked this question. I wish I'd asked this question. So no, don't do that. Doesn't matter if there's a room full of people. Write things down, question, get, even if it's 10, 20 questions, get him to open your file. Tell him what stage one is. Ask him what grade, grade two is. What is estrogen positive? What is estrogen? I mean, I was told I'm going to lose my hair, but I didn't really believe them. I thought, no, they're just, just telling me. It's only I realized during my second chemo, I went for a shower and I screamed because my hand was black and I didn't know why my hand was black. And when I saw the hair fall off my scalp and I thought, it's happening, the chemo is kicking in. And that fear that the chemo is sunk in my body, that's poison in your body. And then I'm thinking, is the poison going to go from my body afterwards? So there's a lot of things going on and you have to understand what it's going to do to you. And it's not all doom and gloom. Some, some people don't have, depend on the drugs you have. It's all tailor-made. It's not, 
if I have cancer and you have cancer, you, they, you'll get the same treatment. No. Mm. People have got different treatments, different therapies going on. So sometimes you might not suffer anything. Sometimes people have mild effects. It really depends on the treatment you're having as well. But it's important to ask questions. And I think um, someone's actually put on the chat uh, that Macmillan is an excellent support line. Um, yes. But I think a lot of our community will probably not access Macmillan because they feel like, what would they know? They're not Muslims. They're not Indians. They don't know. And yes. What's your answer to that? I think that they are a lot better and that the services they provide are really excellent. It's they, they have got people who can speak the language now. They've got leaflets they have translated in different languages. They've got videos and clips going on in different languages. So, and their support groups, uh, Asian support groups there. So there's so many people running groups that they will help you. And there's more awareness for them culturally aware they are now. And they run a lot of courses. And as, that's as a result of that, I become a trainer. And I felt that I've, been, I've got an advantage because I can speak different languages. So if there are somebody in the group, I know I can speak and I can translate to them. So I think there's definitely the services out there to, to be accessed. And they are much better and, and they're more educated now and more knowledgeable in our cultures as well. And I think also, um, like, like you said previously, that it's actually a lot of the um, volunteers that volunteer for Macmillan um, yeah. have either had cancer themselves or have had someone close to them who've had cancer. And yes. again, that really helps because you're able to then empathize a little bit more. Yes. Um, yes. So I think what we tend to do is we look towards maybe one or two people to support us, but we need different support in different aspects of our life. So we may need religious support, we may need emotional support, we may need, um, you know, physical support, we may need, uh, you yeah. know, just, just maybe a laugh with someone, we may need just someone who can, um, you know, make me look at it, things in a different perspective. You know, there's so many different things that I may need and it's okay to ask different people for these different things. Yes, and I think also that uh, to, to talk to your health professional is important because they should see the cancer patient holistically because the whole family is involved. It's the, the family, your, your children, your husband, the carers, they all need support. They need counseling. They need somebody to talk to. And I think more often than not, the cancer patient is there. He's getting, they're getting the treatment, but the carers, the family is forgotten. And often we, we don't realize that they need help. They want to ask questions. They're going through so much. They're not showing their emotions. They're bottling it up. And that's when the counselor, yes, counseling helps. And I think, I remember in my time, my daughter told me that after everything was finished, she said, you know what, mom, I really needed to talk to somebody. I had so many questions. And I was afraid. And it is true. Children really need help. They need somewhere to just, just open themselves up in confidence. And sometimes family can be too close. Sometimes they don't want to ask mom and dad because they think they might upset them. So that's when the counselor, which who are trained, will really come into practice and they will really help as well. Yeah, no, it sounds, I think that's, that's really wise. And I think um, I just, for myself, I'm thinking, you know, a lot of the times when I hear that someone's got cancer, I will do a special dua for them. But I'm thinking now, I think I'd include the family members in that dua as well. And the Allah yes. help them as well, sort of thing. I think that's really important as well, because that's the least I can do, at least pray for them as well as the person who's going through the cancer. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, yes, the, the support that you get from your family is very important, because without them, you really can't get through. And I think your, your, my husband was my rock, my family, my children, my siblings, my extended family, my sisters-in-law, all of them were really great around me. And I think, I think it's also acceptance that now I've got it. You need to accept that you've got cancer. Sometimes you push it behind you and you ignore it and you think that person will get better. But when you physically see that person going through it, you need to learn how to communicate with them as well. And I think they want to be treated normally. They don't want to be treated as a cancer patient mm. or anybody who's ill. If you if you ask them, they'll think, I want to be normal. I want to get back to what I was. And I think that's really important for a cancer patient that I want to live my life normally, the way I was, not what I'm now. And I think 
also to 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 sometimes you 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 know when I lost my hair, um, I didn't like myself. I I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought, oh my god, I've got round face, I've got no hair, I've got little spikes of grey hair coming out. I didn't want to look at myself and. Often I would have a little corner and I would cry and I would never cry in front of my children. And then I thought, oh, well, that's it. I'm going in and out the shower. I didn't take time. It didn't take long. But I didn't like myself. And I'm thinking, when will my hair grow? What will happen to me? I didn't know that. It's, it's funny how you ask for things that you don't, sometimes you, the opposite of what you want. And I had very fine straight hair and I always wanted curly hair. So once my chemo finished, after a year, my hair grew back and it came back curly. And I remember my <laughs> sister asked me, and I said, is this your hair? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's my hair. She said, are you sure? And I said, yes. She touched it. She couldn't believe it. And then it was short-lived. After a year, it went back to my fi very fine, straight, boring hair. But <laughs> it's also important to know that your hair will come back. It's not all doom and gloom that you're going to lose your hair and you're going to be bald forever. Mm. And also there were wigs available at the time, but I didn't like the wigs and it just felt very artificial. So it's really your appearance does matter in the sense you have to like yourself. Uh, it doesn't matter because you want to get through the treatment. You want to get out of it. So sometimes you might feel low. You might have low mood swings. You might feel good. You might feel really sad but that's okay as well you can cry you can laugh that's absolutely fine just be yourself you've got to be yourself i think one of the things that you're saying about how how difficult the treatment was and then you know you're actually putting poison into your into your body through the chemo and everything and also the fact that when you hear cancer a lot of the times you think um that it's a death sentence yes um but i think one of the things that surprised me because i know i was i was of the um I used to think that if I ever got, God forbid, if I ever got cancer, I wouldn't want treatment. I would just, I wouldn't want to go through that. I would just want to just let it take its course. And um, having spoken to, um, you know, um, uh, Said Milani, who is a Wakil of Aithala uh, and being mm -hmm. told that, no, you don't have a choice. You have to, you have to fight for your life and you have to take treatment. Yes. Even if it means you only get one extra day, you have to fight for that yes. one day. And I remember actually having that conversation with him. And saying to him, but why? And he said to me, you know what? Life is so precious. And yes. um, the life that we have is for growth. And even if you put, find yourself in, in the situation that you find yourself because of other people. So, for example, like you were saying with you, um, if it had been found out, if they had heard you at the beginning, you wouldn't have had to go through everything you did. But yes. what you went through helped you to grow and become the person you are because you access yes. the tools that God gave you because God doesn't abandon us. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's what my teacher was trying to tell me is like um, you have to you have to go through it and and grow from it. And and those people around you, your family also grow from it and they become, yes. you know, stronger and better human beings and better Muslims and and hopefully closer yes. to God as well through what they see you going through as well and helping you through yes. that as well. Um, yes. So, yeah, I think it's, it's important to realize that as Muslims, we, we're not allowed to not take treatment. We have to take treatment. Yes. Um, yes. I, even if it's at the end, right up to the end, we have to take treatment. We are not allowed not to take yes. treatment. Absolutely. And I um, think you, you want the best shot of in, in life. You want the best. You, you want to survive. And, you know, there is complementary therapy available as well. So, for example, if you are taking treatment and it's too strong for you, complementary therapy does help. There's reflexology. There's this holistic treatment. There's so much out there now that, it, it can balance. So if you're going through so many side effects, that will really relieve the pain as well. And I think yeah. relaxation therapies, this meditation, even our prayers, I think all that really helps us. And I think, yes, treatment is there. And you have to, I think, like you said, you need to take that because sometimes you'll say, no, I don't want it. But then we've been given a choice. We've been given a second chance in life. Why, why reject it? accept that and say no i'm going to fight it i want to survive i will try my best and if the treatment is too much i will tell that my my oncologist and say look try something else and i think that's what's happened and i think i know that my sister now my younger sister has got it as well and she was telling me 
that she didn't want to take it initially, the chemotherapy and all that. And uh, now it's come back. She said, I have to try this new drug. And I think it's a realization that if something doesn't work, you try something else, but you don't give up. You need to keep on trying that, no, I'm going to survive and I'm going to fight this. It's not something nowadays out there that you can change the drugs. You can say it's not working. I want to try something else. There's so many trials out there, but you have to ask questions. Educate yourself. If you don't ask, they're not going to tell you what's going to do to you. Yeah. So you go there a bit informed, then they, they will take notice. They will, they will know that you are you are educated, you know what you're talking about. And, and stand, you your, ground and ask, yeah, and stand your ground and ask. And when you don't understand something, ask. I think a lot yes. of the times we just, like you're saying, go along with what the doctor says because we feel like yes. they're the yes. experts and they know. Yes. But we have a right to know as well. So actually asking yeah. them to explain. Yes. Is really Absolutely. Important. And I think they, they what they do is... With, I mean, initially, they just give you all the notes and say, like, you're going to go through this, 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 this. They told me, I'm going to have a mastectomy. You come back in two weeks. That's it. I, did, I didn't know what to do, who to ask, and what, what, you know. And uh, I was so confused. Within, within two weeks, I, was, I couldn't sleep, and I'm thinking, they're going to remove my whole breast. That's, the, you know, your femininity, you're, you're, you're a female. I won't have hair. I won't have a breast. What? How will I look? Uh, you know, and... To, to accept that it was very hard for me and I'm saying but why are they asking me to remove my breast and I didn't question them and then just before the surgery I was having some really horrible feeling and I told my husband something doesn't feel right and he said what is it and I said I don't want them to, to, to touch my breast I don't want them to have, you know to take my breast out and he said well now what it's too late and I said no I want to speak to the consultant and he came around just 10 minutes before they were giving me the anesthetic. And I said, look, th th I've got a question for you. And he said, what? And I said, look, I don't, I'm not comfortable with you doing my mastectomy and I'm confused. Why are you doing that? Why can't you just take the lump out? Mm -hmm. And he said, because of your family history. And I said, well, I know that, but I still don't know what to do. Can you tell? And then I said, you know what? What would you do in my place? I put him in a spot. He looked at me and he said, if I was you, Mrs. Panjwani, I would take the lump out first because when you remove your breast, we cannot put it back. But with the lump, if it has spread, you can come back for a second surgery. So that was all I needed. That was the icing on the cake. And I think, right, that's it. I'm going to change my mind. You're going to do a lump back to me. me. And I'm so glad I did that. I'm so thankful for God for guiding me because that was the right decision because yeah. it had not spread to my lymph nodes. So I was very, very lucky. And that's, that's the time I felt that you really need guidance. You need to ask before. Last minute was would have been too late for me and it would have been so unnecessary to remove my breast. Mm. So I was really lucky. So I don't think some people are lucky. Some people don't have that opportunity as well. So I'm blessed like that. And I felt that at that time, he was there at the right time for me. Like you said, somebody is there for us. He answered it so correctly that he gave me peace of mind at that time. So at, at the present, um, where are you on your, on your journey? I'm fine. Your uh, I'm okay at the moment. Uh, I, I'm still raising awareness. I'm, I started as a volunteer with Macmillan and I became a facilitator. I'm an assessor as well. I'm a trainer for them. We run hope courses. I'm also assessing for them. And at the moment, uh, we are part of Hujjat Cancer Support Group and we have a helpline there. We ask for people who are going through the journey, carers, all of them. You know, it's, it's a very tough time for them. Especially, I think also, I feel it's important to mention the psychological impact, the financial impact it has on the families. And we also work together with the Hujat uh, well-being team. So if you are diagnosed or if you need help, there, there is help out there for you. We will try and also signpost you to the right services and we will try and get you the best help possible as well. That's amazing. Still um, because, because of COVID, um, 
it's very funny. Uh, COVID happened when was it? It's now two years now. And when I was coming to the Masma, I thought, I hope I'm well enough. Because during my last talk, which was COVID and cancer, I was supposed to come on live. I was rushed into hospital with COVID. Oh, no. Today, I hope I'm well enough to do the talk show. <laughs> Otherwise, I want to look really bad on me. But you know what? Because of COVID, there's a lot of things that were also halted uh, in our group. So we want to try and get back to the training to deliver the courses and to start the support group and have a coffee morning as well. And at the moment, as the annex and I mean the Hujat also is renovating, so we are trying to you know do that as quickly as possible. Inshallah, inshallah. I did put the poster up while you were talking. I'll put it up again at the end. Um, but yeah. before we finish, if I can ask you, with everything that you've gone through um, and you know everything that you've done, and and it's it's amazing how um, what you've gone through is um, actually made you so much stronger that you've wanted to now be there for others, which which shows how much growth there has been in you um which is amazing to see and i think um hats off to you that you know you, you want to be there to help others through their journey through their um, journey um but if i was to ask you um if you could give us three pieces of advice which maybe if someone had said to you at the beginning of your journey or maybe it's something that you learned throughout your journey which you feel you know you'd want to share with us what would those three pieces of advice be i think it's it, it's learning examining your body and be aware and, and ask and in in your in yourself when you do ask for help. And I think the screening is very important. Don't say no to screening. If you get a letter saying you know you you need to go to screening, don't reject that because if you have got early screening, your referrals, your treatment, everything starts early, it can save your life. It's so so important. If you see anything unusual, and at the moment, the GP practices have gone back to normal and they are putting safety measures in place because of COVID. And the NHS are doing their best to get people seen as quickly as possible. So please, please do go and see them. So and the breastfeeding second, usually happens after the age of 50, am I correct? Yes, 50 to, they're staying now, it's up to 74. They will, okay. it's 50 to 70, but you can request up to 75. Because the cancer rate at the moment is one in two. Statistics is one in two will get it. It's a very high number, yes. So I think you really need, every three years they send you this mammogram screening once you're 50. But if you think there's something abnormal, something you felt a lump, request for one. It doesn't matter if you're under 50 as well. They really should I think rather than I would use the word demand for one, not request, actually demand your doctor to send you one. You know, just don't move up, don't move from there, from the clinic or the, your surgery till he actually sends a letter. And secondly, I think communicating, communicating the right way to the health professionals uh, because it's such a huge psychological impact and financial burden and impact on the family. So make sure you get holistic treatment. I wish I'd known all this, that there's counseling, there are support groups available, there's so many services out there. I wish I knew that. And thirdly, I think empowering your life in a positive way. I think volunteering, a lifestyle, um, eating the right food, exercise, things that make you happy, gratitude, be thankful for what you have, thank God in your life. And I think learning to accept what you have, because sometimes, by not accepting you, you feel, why me, why me? But in my case, I change it around to say, well, why not me? <laughs> nice. Okay, so if I can go through the three things, just so that um, I can just summarize them, if that's okay. So the first one was actually knowing yourself, knowing your body. Um, yeah. From that, I would actually, I, I think one of the things that you said was really beautiful was um, knowing that you're more than just your physical body as well. So being comfortable yes. with who you are even Absolutely. if you look different. I think that, that was really beautiful that you said. So yeah, knowing yourself mm -hmm. and knowing that that if yeah. you feel that there's something wrong, then yes. demand to have it checked yes. out, make sure that you yes. do that and you know, and, yeah. and ask for um, referrals and things. The second one was that um, actually access the um, support groups that are there, the yeah. support that's yeah. there, the holistic support that's there. So not yeah. just um, going for the cancer treatment, but actually 
taking on everything else that's there as well. So the help, you know, the holistic help that's there. Yeah. And this and doesn't all, necessarily have to be from a Muslim. It can be from yeah. anyone. Yeah. And, and I think really that, I'm sorry, Ed, just Masuma, that express your feelings here. And sometimes we, we do not say no, learn the word no, say it. We sometimes don't use the word often thinking that, oh, that person will, will feel bad. If you say, no, don't come home because I'm feeling tired or I'm not up to it. Be confident and just say, look, I'm not up to it today. Maybe can I take a rain check? Can you come another time when I feel up to it? I could really do it with the company another time. We don't use that word now. That's, that's such a sad, sad part that we often think of others that what will they think? But we don't think about ourselves. So be confident and be positive in saying that. I think, again, it's that, that change in mind shift, right? I think we feel like when someone wants to help me or when someone wants to come around, if I say no, karab lakse, you know, they'll feel bad. Absolutely. But if they're doing Absolutely. it with the right near, then yeah. when I say no, they've still got the soap, they've still got the growth from it anyway, with, whether they came or not. Yes, and so, the angels will still accompany them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. again, changing that mind shift that, you know what, this person is doing it to help yeah. me. They're not doing it because they want to burden me. So if it's not yeah. convenient for me, let me tell them it's not convenient because they're not going to yeah. know. Yes, yes. I think yeah. if that's what it is. The fatigue can overtake you and they don't know how you're feeling. But yeah, they just, exactly. they want, they, they're doing the right thing because they think they want to feel, they want to come and see you. So as a friend, as family, they want to do the right thing, be there for you. But at the same time, you're so not up to it. You don't want to get dressed. You're not even feeling like, get, you know, eating or drinking. You just want to lie in bed all day. But then the phone call comes, can we come and see us? Oh, what can I say now? And that is the crucial thing. Just, just saying no, so sorry, but another time. No, I think that's fair enough. I think um, that that that's really, really important to actually access all the help that's there. So even help from the services, um, help from, um, like you said, counselling, even dietitians, um, yes. you know, yes. um, health coaches, yes. Yes. Um, financial, co you know, financial wise, get whatever help is required. And from friends, you know, like you're saying, you know, ask them to make you soup or, you know, I don't feel like cooking today. Can you send over food? Um, yeah just anything literally anything that you you know we need we need to help and ask for help and i think that's not just when you have cancer i think in any no, aspect no. of our life when we yes. need help yes. we need to yes. actually ask for help because people can't read our minds no. and i think it no. it does humble you when other people step up yes. and help you and it Absolutely. makes you actually feel closer to god because it makes you realize that god has sent all these amazing people in our lives which yes. are willing to put aside their comfort and their ease to be there for us and i think that's such a beautiful Absolutely. bonding moment yes and i think you will feel close and you will find your genuine friends and people that are there for you at that time because they will be there for you because because they don't understand you that doesn't mean that oh they're bad people or whatever but they want to help but they don't know how so i yes. think you have to guide them Ask. You really yeah. have to write. That's where I think communication. Be open. Be honest with them. You know, just just say how you're feeling. Express your feelings. Ask for help. Things like that. Sometimes we feel that oh, how can I how can I burden somebody? But you're not burdening them. They want to do it. Given the opportunity. Yeah, you're good. giving them yeah. an opportunity. And if they feel burdened or if they feel bad, then that's they weren't asking with the right knee, and that's their journey, Absolutely. not yours. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are so many services helpline. Apart from like we learned the other services, there are other cancer support groups, any illness, even whether you're going to depression, dementia, anything. There's so many things out there for particular groups. There's chat line, there's forums. If you're feeling lonely, you can just go on, on and chat to them. People who are going through the same thing will share and empathize with you. Brilliant. And the last thing that you said was actually to um, grow from the, from the situation, to look at the positives, to... Yeah to rather than thinking why me why not me because this is someone something that god has given you because he knows you can handle it um yes. and and you'll grow from it and and actually i think one of the things that um nishat by kept saying was look at the beautiful colors there's no black yes. in the rainbow so yes. why are we looking at the blackness why are we Absolutely. not looking at the beautiful colors around us yes i so, really yeah. yes such a positive person when i was reading a blog and i really empathized what she was going through I could actually feel myself there and I felt what she felt. So it was it was very poignant when I read her blog as well. 
again, I think reinforcing the fact that it's important to talk to someone who's been through it so that they can yes. actually empathize with you and, and you know, you can get some sort of, um, you know, you, you can feel that they understand rather than you having yes. to try, try to explain it, which is really, really yes. important. Yes. And sometimes you do get tired just explaining, explaining. But like you say, yeah. if someone has been through it, you don't have to say anything. They're just going to be there for you. And that's what you need as well. So, so if somebody who's been through it, somebody, somebody who's been trained, uh, they will be there for you. In the right, You will get the right help as well. But you need to ask for it. Inshallah. Okay, thank you so much, Nassim Bhai. Um, it, thank you very, very much for being so open and, and um, telling us your story. And, and we've learned a lot from it. Um, before I finish, I'd like us to remember Marum Nishat by um, and all our Marum means with the Surah Fatiha, please. And this is the um, poster for Hujat Cancer Support, um, which has got the, the number 0208-420-7923, option four, then option six. And um, you can also email them on cancer at hujat.org. And if they, um, they can, they'll be able to help you. And if not, at least signpost you to where you can get the help that you require, inshallah. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you again. Um, Inshallah, we will be back again um, the first Sunday of every month. So, inshallah, next um, month um, will be, I think, the third, if I'm not mistaken, um, of October. Yes, the third of October, inshallah, we will be back with a new guest. So, please join us on the third of October and um, we will see you then. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair.